more three-headed frogs, more kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and I'm here with my co-host, Rebecca Wood. Yes, and together we are going to shape the amazing hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in the ways they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the health and happiness of your friends and family and your neighbors and your pets and your garden plants. And uh, I think that's where I wanted to start off this week is uh, talking a little bit about garden plants, because uh, for a lot of people, the garden is sort of their intersection between their normal lives and nature. And it's a good one. I mean, you know, growing food has been a human thing for what, like 10,000 years now, roughly? Long time. Yeah. So uh, it's a good Gardening is good. It's good for you. you. The food you get is healthier than the food you buy, usually. And they think that, like, even hunter-gatherers sort of subtly did things to encourage stuff they wanted to grow again the next year, didn't they? I mean, yeah. I, even when you're not doing straight-on farming, you're kind of like, well, you know, let's drop these seeds from this over here where it likes to grow or something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I suspect a lot of that happened. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And there was also, of course, incidental and accidental, you know, you drop some seeds as you're eating or picking or harvesting or moving stuff around. So, so we've had a long, good relationship with plants. And uh, I just wanted to mention one little experiment I'm doing in my garden this year. And that is uh, way back in middle school, I was taught that the Native Americans uh, had a system of planting, of companion planting, and they called it the Three Sisters. And they planted corn, beans, and squash together. And the reason, well, now we know that the beans put nitrogen in the soil. You know, they, they didn't know about nitrogen, but they knew that the beans were putting stuff in the soil that the corn needed. And then the corn gives the beans uh, structures as they need vines to grow tall and have lots of beans on them. And the squash stays down low on the ground and it shades out the weeds. So Yeah, very good. Yeah, so it's like this uh, wonderful symbiotic relationship that kind of mimics the sort of thing you get out in the natural world, in the in the you know unhuman world. So I tried that this year, and I'm, I have to say I'm kind of amazed at the the way these pl plants are growing. They kind of exploded out of the ground. I mean, really, the corn is well past knee high already, and uh, you know I I didn't know what I was doing. I just sort of tossed it all in there together. And I, you know, posted on Facebook. So a lot of people have kindly told me whatever, <laughs> everything I've been doing wrong about it. <laughs> oh, people on Facebook are so good about that. They are. <laughs> <laughs> but even though I did it wrong, quote unquote, in a lot of ways, it's still turning out really, really well. Because so, the first person who did it probably did it wrong, too, and then refined their technique over time, you know? Right. Did it wrong and all of a sudden got more corn and more squash and was like, hey, this is this is something here and you know so lots of lots of long-term wisdom there in that in that process so we have the native americans to thank for like the concepts of things like uh, companion planting and fertilizer even so um it's just a, a fun thing that i'm doing in my yard <sighs> and i got an invitation to do another fun thing <laughs> which uh, an invitation which i i turned down uh and i i I need to tell you folks about this because this kind of gets to the heart of what's wrong with Ohio right now. Um, we only I, have an hour, Joe. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sort of approaching this gingerly because it's a little hard to talk about. But right. uh, but I got an invitation from the governor. I got an invitation from the, the, the governor's office to participate in something called the Governor's Fish Ohio Day which uh, sounds like a wonderful event. Uh, you get to go and you get to go out 
on Lake Erie for a charter fishing trip, and then you get to go, uh, they give you lunch, and then you hear a nice speech by the governor, which sounds great, uh, except that I'm like kind of a journalist covering the governor. <laughs> right. And and so you, you really, this is not how journalists need to relate to the people that they're covering. I mean, I, I can't, I shouldn't be offered gifts and I can't accept gifts. And I, I did talk, I did talk with, a, well, I had a little conversation with another journalist in the region who I'm not going to name because I don't want to get them in any kind of trouble. I'm not casting aspersions on them, but they said they've done these things before, that they've gone on canoe trips with congressmen and, you know, it's, and this didn't feel right. And so I actually contacted the uh, Society of Professional Journalists because they are the ones who've come up with the professional code of ethics for mm -hmm. journalists. And I actually talked to Andy Schatz, who's their chair of their ethics uh, committee, and I sent him an invitation. And he was kind of shocked. <laughs> he was like, usually there's like some pretense that this is something that is going to teach you something, like they're going to show you a project or something. Right. Uh, but this this one apparently is just, you know, come come have a nice fishing trip and a, and a nice lunch with us and then listen to the governor. And this kind of, you know, Ohio is sort of, it's almost naive and it's corruption. You know, it's like they're not, they don't even realize that this is corruption. This is like, we're right. just inviting the journalists to come, you know, have a nice time. And, and, and you can't do that. You've got to maintain some degree of separation. You know, I can't be both covering you as a journalist and your buddy. I, I, like I said, I sent him a copy of the thing and he sent me back a copy of the, the journalist code of ethics and, I, I consider myself sort of a fringe journalist because I'm just as much talk show host as I am journalist. And uh, but still, this this was beyond the fringe. I mean, so just uh, just something I hope this doesn't mean I don't get to interview any more state, uh, <laughs> you know, like the ODNR wildlife experts anymore because right. they're they you know they've been a great part of the show yeah, I've, yeah. I've loved having them on and they've given everybody a lot of really good information but uh, but uh, a fishing trip which is worth you know it costs about five six hundred dollars to charter one of those fishing trips for a morning so this is you know this is not an insignificant gift if it if I were to accept it so uh, yeah so what do you think about this uh, give us a call at uh, 877-907-1007 that's 877-907-1007 or you can text anytime during the show at 419-973-5841. That's 419-973-5841. And uh, just let me know, do you think I'm overreacting here, folks? Do you think... Uh, <laughs> You think maybe I should just have gone on the trip and, you know. Because, you know, we're, we're kind of amateurs here. We didn't go to journalism school, you know. We don't hardly get paid, you know. we. How are we supposed to know this isn't okay, really, unless Joe had been really on the ball? Yeah, yeah. And and I did, you know, I have a degree in English, which, so, you know, which is kind of related to what I'm doing here. Although I, you know, I know if some of my old English professors are listening, there have definitely been times during the show they'd be cringing at <laughs> Some of the way I, some of the sentence constructions I made have not good, right? So, um, but uh, yeah, what do you think, folks? Is it, and this reminded me of uh, what happened with House Bill 6. They, one of the things House Bill 6 did was it got rid of the subsidies for solar power in Ohio. And uh, this was stood to cost uh, the city of Bowling Green tens of millions of dollars because they had built their whole solar farm based on the idea that the state gave these subsidies. And so it was all part of their budget and their planning. And so what Teresa Gavaron, our state senator for Bowling Green did was she went and she talked to the guys, you know, some of whom are now in prison, <laughs> the guys who were crafting House Bill 6 oh my. and said, look, you know, this is going to hurt Bowling Green. We need a special carve out for Bowling Green. Oh, right. right. Not that it's a bad law. It's just it doesn't benefit us. Okay. Right. Okay. And she got the special carve out, you know, okay. the special, you know, favor, the insider political favor for Bowling Green. And she was so happy about it. She called a press conference and said, I've got this special carve out for Bowling Green. And she became a co-sponsor of the bill and not even realizing that is also corruption. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. If you get special favors 
for your, you know, just for you, and well, you it's do called it. called pork belly, right? I mean. Well, pork belly is a little different, but. Okay. But this is more like a like a special favor just for you, you know, this, right. and then at the cost of everyone else, because, you know, the whole state needed those uh, solar subsidies and we right. still need them. We should still be subsidizing solar because it's better than the coal that we've got. And uh, actually that, that relates into our uh, interview that we're going to have today. We're going to hear from Sandy Buchanan. But it's kind of important, you know, that sometimes people stop and ask themselves, is this ethical? It doesn't seem like that big a deal, but is it this, uh, is this in fact ethical? <laughs> right. And, you know, that's... Otherwise you can just kind of slide into stuff. Right. And that's what uh, Andy Schatz told me, basically, when I told him about this. And I said, you know, this just doesn't feel right. And he said, you know, trust your feelings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, your feelings are correct on yeah. this. So, um so sorry, Governor DeWine, I have to politely decline your kind offer of a, of a fishing trip on Lake Erie, much as I love going out on Lake Erie fishing, because I've only done it once, but it was it was wonderful. Lake Erie is nice. I, I like the ferries to and from the, the islands. Oh, yeah, those are cool. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so far this year, no blue-green algae, knock on wood. Yay. So that makes it even nicer. We yeah. don't like that stuff. No. Um, <laughs> All right, so uh, the rest of the show, we're, uh, shortly we're going to hear from Sandy Buchanan, who's going to tell us a bit about Prairie State, because uh, I think this is an important issue since it affects all our electric bills, and it also affects um, the amount of carbon we're putting in the air. It has all kinds of important effects on the whole region, not just Ohio. Uh, then we'll hear from our fantastic advertisers and patrons who... You know, I hope I don't lose my advertisers, too, because I declined this kind of rotation. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, also, then we're going to hear from Rebecca. She's going to talk to us a little bit about raccoons, those rascally raccoons. And uh, then ecological news. And as I said, hopefully at some point we'll hear from you at 877-909-1007. And, of course, uh, text anytime, 419-973-5841. So what do you think? Were you shocked by this uh, invitation from the governor? Or do you think, Joe, you sh should have just got on the boat and <laughs> shut up? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're ready to go to our interview with Sandy Buchanan. So, Josh, if you could pull that up. And uh, Ms. Buchanan has done a lot of research, and I mean literally years of research on uh, Prairie State and other energy issues in her role as executive director of the IEEFA, which uh, you'll hear about in just a moment. So uh, are we set, Josh? All right. Here is Sandy Buchanan. Okay. Welcome to For Agreed Future. If you could start with your name and your position. Uh, Sandy Buchanan. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, or IEFA. Ah, IEFA. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Sandy, the reason I asked you on is because we have uh, all over the Midwest, there, a lot of cities have contracted with something called Prairie State. It has a, a big effect in terms of things like how much carbon we put into the air, how much electricity costs. Um, could you just give us some background on, on what the whole Prairie State issue is about? Sure. Uh, so the Prairie State is a coal plant, a coal-fired power plant in southern Illinois. And the uh, plant was built because Peabody Coal, headquartered out of St. Louis, had a coal mine uh, in southern Illinois that was unmarketable. They were not able to sell the coal to other customers because of the quality of the coal. And they decided, this was in the mid-2000s, that they would, the way to have a market for that coal would be to build a coal plant next door that would burn that coal-fired power. So... They began a project to build a coal-fired power plant in southern Illinois, and this was right at the time when there were 150 new coal plants pr uh, proposed around the United States under the Bush-Cheney era, and almost all of them were never built. They were almost all canceled because of their economic and environmental damage, and construction prices were going up all around the world. But uh, Peabody decided that the way to... Um, make this work would be to go to a lot of the municipal umbrella agencies that um, cover public power systems, just like in Bowling Green, which is part of uh, American Municipal Power or AMP, um, and get them to take on the financial responsibility for the project. And, and that's what they did. Uh-huh. 
and uh, taking on the financial responsibility meant uh, actually taking a lot of risk, didn't it? Yes, what it meant was that in, in Ohio's case, American Municipal Power, or AMP, went to uh, dozens of communities in Ohio and asked them to sign 50-year, it's 5-0-year, take or pay contracts, which means that the cities would have to pay for the power uh, no matter how much it cost and actually whether or not it was ever generated um, to be part of this um, project to get a, each city would take a certain amount of power uh, through this contract. And, you know, they, they were warned <laughs> at various times that this might be very expensive power. But Bowling Green and a number of other cities went through, not all, some cities uh, turned it down, but um, many cities did. And then this was replicated in municipal power agencies in a number of other states, including Missouri, Illinois, ultimately Indiana, Michigan. There were various states that were part of the Prairie State deal. Uh-huh. And do you have a, a handle on how many communities were sucked into this deal? It's around 200, mostly in the Midwest, and then there, there's a few AMP communities that are as far east as Virginia. And uh, a lot of them are, are unhappy right now because I, I think they were promised they were promised low-priced coal, weren't they? I mean, they were warned it could be expensive, but but the uh, the promise from Peabody and the promise from from Prairie State was this would be inexpensive power. Yeah, what the, what happened was they came to the communities and, you know, not just the ones in Ohio, but in other states too, and um, presented, you know, feasibility studies that they had hired, um, you know, enge not engineering firms to do, uh, some of whom had conflicts of interest, so that was interesting. But these these firms would present information that AMP would give to the communities that would show that, you know, projections that would say what the power would cost over a certain amount of time. And those, of course, are all based on the construction cost of the plant and also would be um, in comparison to the market price of power. And so they would always show miraculously, no matter what, that the Prairie State price would be lower than the market cost of power. And uh, all of that turned out to be wrong, and one of the big problems was that the, the plant went $1 billion over budget right out of the gate. So that already raised the, the price of the power because there were bonds issued to pay for that, and um, then there were many operational problems that made the power more expensive. Yeah, that, I should mention. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. There was, there was an explosion at one point, wasn't there? Yeah, at one point there was an explosion. They had a, a lot of operational problems, some of which were caused by the fact that as the plant was becoming more expensive to build, one of the cost-cutting sort of deal measures that the the plant came up with was to buy uh, boilers. You know, these coal plants have giant boilers that burn the coal and different kinds of coal in different regions have different characteristics for burning. So because so many plants were being canceled around the United States, there was, um, there were burners or I'm, I'm sorry, boilers on the market that were built for other plants that were never built. So Prairie state ended up buying boilers that had been proposed for a plant in Texas and never, so they were not used. They just had never been used. It's what they call the gray market. But they were built for Powder River Basin coal out of the western states, which is a different type of coal properties. And so when they started burning the Illinois coal in this plant, they had a lot of operational problems. They would have to, like, dynamite slag out of the insides of this plant because it was accumulating. It, it was really uh, problematic. I, I remember seeing a picture of a, the building that housed the boilers with a, a huge hole in the side of it. Yeah. Yes, there was a then. That was the case. And um, we actually hired a photographer to go and take an aerial photo of it at the time because you want to document these things when they happen. Right. All right. So we've got two, 200 communities all around the country locked into these 50-year contracts by an expensive above market price now coal, coal power. Uh, a lot of the, these communities are, are not happy, right? A lot of them have, have definitely have buyer, what you'd call buyer's remorse. Yes, and so what's happened, unfortunately, is all the things that a number of us feared have come to pass, and the 
the power from Prairie State is now uh, well above the market price of power because what's happened is the market price has gone down significantly because of uh, natural gas fired power, which brought originally brought the market price down, but now renewables are cheaper solar, wind, and they're bringing the market price down. So you have a coal plant competing, you know, really right now, the Prairie State Power is about twice the price of market power and is also above what the communities were told when they got those feasibility studies back in in 2007. It's more expensive than what what was projected at the time. Okay. And uh, at the same time, we're putting billions of tons of co2 in the air is that right yeah it's a it's a huge emitter and um of co2 but of course also of other pollutants that come from coal-fired power that are are bad for the lungs and the environment and and there's an additional uh issue with prairie state which is not only do the communities own a coal plant and a coal mine they also own the coal ash dump so it was a deal which includes a coal ash dump which was not there were problems with that too it wasn't built in the original location provided it was actually built right next again right in the vicinity of the of the um plant in illinois and as you may know coal ash is extremely toxic and there's been a number of serious problems around the country with uh, exposure to coal ash and so there's additional environmental problems from you know that can be caused by that yeah it's it's full of heavy metals and it because it's ash, it can sort of get picked up and carried around by the wind and stuff. Right, and blown around, yep. It's nasty stuff. Okay, so now some communities are trying to get out of this, right? And and there's some uh, proposed political solutions to this to the prairie state problem. Yeah, so what's happening now is, um, to my knowledge, there's only been one community that actually got out, and that was Marceline, Missouri, who fairly early on saw the writing on the wall and said, no, we, this is way too expensive. And they were able to negotiate an exit with their umbrella power agency in Missouri. Um, a number of people, as you say, are having buyer's, buyer's remorse. They're seeing this put upward pressure on their electric rates. That is particularly a problem in Cleveland because Cleveland is the only municipal utility in Ohio, and I don't know. It may not. It may be the only one in the country, or close to close to the only one that competes directly with the private utility um, for customers. So in Cleveland, if you have Cleveland Public Power, if the first energy power is cheaper, you can just switch overnight to that. So when about Prairie State's power becomes more expensive than the market, it's a death knell for Cleveland Public Power. It's not just Prairie State. They have some other amp deals that are expensive, and they have a lot of um, uh, maintenance problems as well. But it's definitely contributed to a, a bad situation for them. Okay. And uh, right now, Illinois is actually, the legislature is talking about stepping in, aren't they? Yeah, it's an interesting situation. There's a, there's a push on has been in Illinois for quite a while for something called the Clean Energy Jobs Act. And it would, the idea was to close a lot of the coal fired power remaining in Illinois. Illinois is a lot like Ohio, where they've had many, many coal fired power plants, a, a number of which have now shut down because of market conditions. Um, they're just not competitive anymore, but there are still are some operating, the biggest one of which is Prairie State. And the legislation would propose to close Prairie State. Um, I think the latest thing was 2035, but there's been a lot of opposition to closing it from some of the people who support the plant in the region and then also some of the municipalities who are afraid they're going to get stuck with the cost of the bonds, um, even if the plant closes. Uh, so. As of today, <laughs> that legislation has not passed. I, they keep talking about coming back, um, but uh, we don't. I don't know what the projection is there in Illinois. Okay. So, um, so how much do you think that this has uh, sort of affected the, the generation in the region, and and how does this affect the the whole idea that we're supposed to be getting off carbon? Well, it's it, you know sometimes we feel like this may be the one of the very last coal plants in the country to close. I mean, plants are closing at rapid rates all over the country. 
coal-fired power. But because of the complex financial nature of this and the fact that Peabody, by the way, originally owned 5% of the plant, they held on to 5%, and then a uh, number of years ago, they sold their 5%. They got out of it completely and sold that 5% to a co-op in, in Indiana, uh, which got it for a fraction of the price of the price that all the other municipalities had paid. And if I had been one of the other municipalities, I think I would have brought that up. But so, yeah, it's a big polluter. And, um, you know, the good news, of course, is that renewables are coming on the market rapidly um, and at lower cost. And, you know, as, as storage becomes better and better developed, they will help to stabilize the grid. But the bad news is that for communities that are locked into these uh, contracts, you know, they're tying up their capital, too. So if you're already getting a huge chunk of your power from Prairie State and you're stuck in that contract, you won't be able to just buy renewables instead, uh-huh. which is something that, of course, we were have been bringing up all along. And um, so we d- we think that municipalities, not just in Ohio, but elsewhere, really need to explore what might be some alternative financial mechanisms for getting out of this we we feel like also the bondholders who have already made a fortune from this plant um from the interest rate may just end up needing to take a haircut on this yeah that's that sounds good they they made their money (laughs) now there's there's larger issues at stake so so um tell us a little bit about your organization and uh if people want to follow what you folks are doing how would they do that Well, thank you. Yeah, so we are a global think tank working on um, energy finance issues. We look at sort of the uh, how to accelerate the energy transition around the world. Our headquarters are in Cleveland, and then we have a number of analysts and communications team folks in the U.S. and eight other countries. So we look at how these issues are playing out in many parts of the globe. Um, put out a lot of reports and commentary, and all of that is available on our website, which is ieefa.org. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yes, and thank you folks for listening. And uh, what did you think of what Sandy had to say there? It's, uh, you know, the, th- this plant, this Prairie State plant is kind of, lurking behind a lot of the problems we have with our our electrical grid in terms of carbon and our the price of our electricity because as she said you know they keep having technical problems they keep having to borrow more money the price keeps going up and up and uh, if we were able to just switch over to the wind and the solar and the the kind the, the theme that kind of ties all this together this this you know the invitation prairie state um you know House Bill 6, all these problems, is that we've got the public is not involved enough in making these decisions because um, the public, you know, if if these Prairie State uh, deals had come up before the public, I'm confident, you know, I, I believe in democracy. I think most of the people, most of the time, are smarter than any little group of people that, that sort of gets all you know, into themselves and kind of shuts everybody else out, which is a, a wonderful, cozy relationship to establish if you're a politician with, with journalists or if you're somebody who's running a municipal power company and you, you know, you don't want to deal with all the pesky, you know, customers who, who say things like we want cheaper power and we want solar power and we want wind power, which are cheaper. You know, you, you people in power decisions make get into these little clicks, these little groups and they make bad decisions, you know. And corporate America is just basically a, a, a giant ball of bad ideas wrapped in cash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, lots of times. Now they are, uh, to be fair, some some are trying to make the transition. Some are trying to change things, and and you know, their ethics. This idea of ethics has sort of come back into some of the boardrooms, but there's a lot of them where it, it isn't. So yeah. Um, all right, but. Uh, Let's see now uh, that we've had that. And if you could, you know, once again, you can call anytime, 877-909-1007. And uh, right now it's time, though, to hear something nice to hear from our sponsors. All right. Four Green Futures brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. 
They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. So you don't have to live in Wood County to enjoy a Wood County Park. Just come on down and, and you know, ha- take a walk. Uh, there's several ways to get a hold of them. One is to call 419-353-1897. It's 419-353-1897. You can also go to their website, which is wcparks.org. And uh, you can download their Nifty app. Just go to any app store and search for WC Parks. And, of course, search for them on social media, Instagram, Facebook, etc. That's the Wood County Park District. And Four Green Futures also brought to you by our wonderful, amazing patrons. And these are fantastic people who we can't have enough positive adjectives to describe who've uh, gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And they uh, searched for Four Green Future. Our show popped up and they signed up for a uh, monthly small donation comes out of their checking account, comes over to us. And that's how we can keep this show coming. So please consider becoming one of them. Uh, Heading over to patreon.com. Super groovy people. Yeah. And be one (laughs) of the super groovy people. Okay. So uh, that's our sponsors. And so now it's time to hear from Rebecca. And I understand you've been having some uh, interactions with some raccoons lately. We have in our weirdly wildlifey urban neighborhood uh, this week. Some baby raccoons have been like several days running, coming and in, in, in playing on our lawn. They let me get in within two feet of them, mm-hmm. which leaves us with a conundrum because uh, baby raccoons, I mean, generally baby wildlife, you're, if you see them, you're supposed to wait for the mom to come back. Right. And But we keep seeing them over and over and over again, and there are pit bulls around the corner. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's been a division of opinion about this on uh, apparently the raccoon rescue group. Uh-huh. Oh, and so you consulted the raccoon rescue people. Yeah, and it ranged from, oh, you're so wonderful, you're a saint for trying to trying to trap them, to uh, you're horrible and evil and Satan for trying to trap them. <laughs> so oh, okay. the feedback has been confusing. But mm-hmm. yeah, it made me a little curious about raccoons. Um, the raccoons are native to North America. They're in the pro- Procyonid family. Mm. <laughs> Apparently, there's um, the one that we all know about that's uh, mostly in North America, the northern part of North America, all over is the common raccoon. But there are a bunch of uh, tropical, little known tropical subspecies, apparently, or uh-huh. subtropical. So they go down as far as the Caribbean, basically. Um, originally, I think they were from Eastern Europe somewhere, Russia and Bulgaria. Um, they're one of those species that originated in the old world. Came over here on the land bridge and then became extinct in Europe. Hmm, interesting. And uh, now they've gone back and are invasive species in Europe and Japan. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's complicated. (laughs) And, um, yeah, so they like forest near water, forest with, you know, some kind of little creek running through it or something uh, the best. They also, they're very adaptable. They also live on farms and coastal marshes and the mountains. Uh, They're known for being pretty bright and having their own agenda, which is not yours. (laughs) (laughs) They're generally nocturnal and omnivorous. So they uh, they eat about forty percent invertebrates, twenty seven percent vertebrates, and thirty three percent plants. Hmm. In case you have ever wondered, they're also very fond of marshmallows. <laughs> but yeah, so usually uh, they've recently found out that um, it was thought they were solitary, but apparently the females live in groups of four with their kits. For the same reason Uh-oh. female cats do that to kind of, you know, if a, if a invading tomcat comes and tries to get the babies to so that they'll come into heat sooner and have his babies instead, then somebody can raise the alarm and then all of them will come running. Uh-huh. So kind of the same deal. They have their kits in the spring and then uh, they spend the summer together and basically disperse in the fall. The young go and find their own territory. Uh, usually live one to three years in the wild, although in captivity they've lived up to 20 years. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Uh, their name is from a rac- uh, an Alg- Algonquin word meaning 
animal that scratches with its hands. But all over the world, the local term for them tends to be, you know, you're parts of South America. They're, they're, they're mostly called little washer bears in many mm-hmm. cultures, you know, whatever the local language is for that, because they're known for their habit of liking to wash their food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and uh, they did some research. Initially, they thought they were related to weasels, but no, they actually are pretty close, closely related to bears, it turns out. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, according to DNA, which has caused them to reevaluate some things. <laughs> yeah, that causes a lot of people to reevaluate. things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it does. <laughs> right. So, yeah, and um, there's this one story I remember hearing on the radio about one of the subspecies called a Guadalupe raccoon from the island of Guadalupe. Um, it was initially thought a long, long time ago, I think, that it was a uh, it was a, it was a independent species. But and and the Guadalupians were all over this because um, at the time, you know, they were declaring they were you know trying to getting enthused about having a unique cultural identity identity outside their colonizing power, which was France. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they were, and there, there isn't, you know, Guadalupe is an island. It doesn't really have any unique animals that aren't found anywhere else. So they really rat, latched onto this rac- raccoon thing. It was like a patriotic thing, and a, and a lot of people had pet raccoons. And um, then someone found out, so for a while it was thought that that specimen that they thought was a smaller species of raccoon that was unique to the island turned out to actually for all they thought it was um they were just regular raccoons they were just regular raccoons that weren't any different and then um the authorities decided they were an invasive species and they started going around and confiscating people's raccoons and sometimes people were very very upset about this oh man yeah danger of getting into actual physical fights over it. <laughs> you, can't, you know, you'd have to pry my raccoon for my cold dead fingers. They were not kidding about this stuff. They really oh. like the raccoons in Guadalupe. And now I think they've settled on the compromise that they are in fact a subspecies. Okay. They probably came there only like a couple hundred years ago. They're related to the Bahamian raccoon, which is now extinct, and also to uh, raccoons from Virginia and Maryland. Hmm. So now there's, you know, there's still a lot of controversy. Are they, are they an in, in invasive species? Or they're, they're dwindling. Their numbers are dwindling because of habitat loss and because of something called the, I believe, the crab, crab eating raccoon. Oh, really? So there's competition. Yeah, which oh. is an even more invasive species, which definitely just got there. Mm-hmm. So kind of nobody knows what to do with these things. Do we kill them? Do we keep them as pets? Do we just let things run their course? And I think people still have very strong opinions about that in, in Guadalupe. Hmm. All right. So Guadalupe, how do you say that? I think Guadalupe. Guadalupe, yeah. yeah that's good. I'm thinking Spanish is Guadalupe. So just a word of advice. If you go to Guadalupe, go to a bar, don't start talking no, about raccoons. No. Okay. All right. Get in such a big fight. It'll be bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Rebecca, for that uh, little <laughs> chat about raccoons. And so have you decided what you're going to do with the raccoons that are playing in your yard? Because... Playing in the yard during the day kind of suggests to me the mother's not around. Yeah, or they say she might just be out hunting, but they keep doing this day after day, mm. you know, and, and there's the pit bulls in the next yard. And they have I, we've seen them like going up the steps in the next yard anyway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So even if the mom is there, it's like, I don't know, it's kind of an ethical conundrum. We're not really sure what to do. I haven't figured it out yet. I think okay. Barbie is still trying to uh, still trying to trap them. All right. Well, if anybody has some advice, you want to jump she, in? She played raccoon noises, a tape of raccoon noises. She got off the, <laughs> like at midnight. The other day, uh-huh. and it was really loud, and huh. I, was, I was two rooms away trying to sleep. Well, that, that's a little <laughs> risky because you don't know what the raccoon was saying. So. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if you want to jump in and help Rebecca with her r- raccoon conundrum, give us a call, 877-909-1007. All right, but now we're going to go on to our ecological news segment. Alrighty. And there's a lot happening all over the world, although we're going to start today with uh, a very local story down there in Bowling Green, Ohio, where I've talked before about the fact that the Municipal Utility Board has decided to put in a fine or penalty on solar panels. Well, uh, what those of us who are in favor of rooftop solar are doing, we started a petition drive down there. So this is it. This is a case, see, where I'm actually crossing that ethical line because I'm no longer a journalist because I'm actually one of the people organizing the petition drive. Right. So, 
So that's why I'm not really a journalist, quote unquote. But, right. But uh, I have to report that we just started this week and the enthusiasm for signing this petition is amazing because, uh, you know, across the political spectrum, conservatives and liberals, everybody is like, you should be able to put solar panels on your own house if you want to. And the city shouldn't be like stepping in and trying to prevent that. So it just intuitively seems wrong. Yeah. And it, I, it is actually wrong. Right. And like Andy Schott said, you know, trust your feelings Indeed. there. Yeah. It's, so. a case, it's a case of that. Okay. So I uh, just wanted to mention that and that's going well. Um, then we leap off to someplace where things aren't going quite so well. And that's the, the gigantic heat wave. You know, you've heard about this, I'm sure, on the mainstream media. But uh, yesterday, Portland, Oregon hit 108 degrees which is an all-time record for Portland, Oregon. Oh. But don't worry, because that record is going to be shattered today into you know thousands of little pieces because no. they are going to hit 115 today, 115 Yikes. degrees in Portland, Oregon. And if you you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Northwest there, but usually it's like cold and wet, you know, yeah. all the time. I don't think they can deal with it. it would, well, you know, it's probably still humid. Oh, yeah. Just in a different way. There's humid. And, <laughs> and only 30% of the houses have any air conditioning. Oh, no. Because they haven't needed it. So, oh. so if you're in 115 degree heat with no air conditioning, this has the potential today to be, you know, a really yeah, dangerous situation. So, uh, you know, if you tell your friends, you know, if you've got somebody out there in, in the Portland or in the Northwest there, because it's the entire Northwest, it's not just Portland, but mm -hmm. that's one of the places where it's the worst. Tell them to go down to the basement and just spend the day in the basement because uh, because it's not, uh, you know, it's not good. And of course, this is a sign of global warming, you know, and don't, this is not normal people don't try to. This is not say, how the weather say, was in the 80s. This is just weather. Yeah, no. <laughs> 115 degrees is really not, well, it's normal for Death Valley. Right, yeah. yeah but it's it's, it's not really normal. normal anywhere else. So, um, yeah, so that's a big story going on. And from there, we leap down to uh, Brazil, which is, you know, also a, a very hot, humid place, although it normally is hot and humid. Uh, turns out Brazil's environment minister under Bolsonaro uh, and his fellow named Ricardo Sale, he has resigned because uh, what's happening is there's been an explosion of deforestation in Brazil under Bolsonaro. And some of it legal, some of it, you know, Bolsonaro actually negotiated big timber sales to these companies, but some of it illegal. He's a special kind of guy, Bolsonaro. Oh, yeah. And so what happened is uh, the police, the Brazilian police, state police started investigating some of these illegal timber sales. And the minister of the environment, Richard Sale, stuck himself in there and just said, you know, nope, stop, stop investigating that. <laughs> Which is actually what you call obstruction of justice yes. and, and is illegal to, to try to stop the police from having an investigation. Right. We had something similar. Yeah. And so he has resigned. Uh, and it's not looking good for him. And uh, Bolsonaro has already got his replacement picked out, who was a fella from, uh, who was part of something called the, uh, uh, well, it's a farming group, basically. And, and a lot of the deforestation is also being pushed by farming because uh, the soil doesn't stay fertile down there because it's a rainforest soil. So you, you cut off a bunch of forest, plant a bunch of plants, you get three, four, five years of crops, the soil it dies after that all the nutrients are used up and you've got to move on and cut some more forest yeah. and and so uh this has been going on for like a hundred years and there's a, a fella named joaquim alvaro Pereira lieta who is a board member of the brazilian rural society which is essentially a lobby group for the these farmers these uh land destroying farmers so now he's uh who bolsonaro wants to replace Sale. So basically somebody just as bad. But it's uh, it's interesting that even in that situation, even in the situation where you have a, a corrupt, very corrupt prime minister, some of the, the functions of a civil society are still working. The police are still pressing charges, you know, trying to bring people to justice. It's just very hard 
to to not be corrupt when the very top is corrupt. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a big thing going on in Brazil. Uh, update on Ferry Creek. As we remember, a few weeks ago, we had a guest on who was part of the blockade of the old growth logging on uh, Victoria Island out there in British Columbia. And that it's still going fast and furious. Basically, what's happening is it's it's coming down to a war of attrition here because the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, are continuing to arrest people even though it's been said that they're going to defer logging on these old growth sections. People are still going up there to defend them because the logging trucks and logging companies are still going up and and looking, you know, like they're, and they're gonna, not arresting them. No, no, they're not arresting them. OK, so so that would be like not following the law. It would almost seem like. Well, except it wasn't a law. It was just kind of more like a suggestion or a guideline. Oh, you know? right. <laughs> so uh, what's happening is the protesters are locking themselves into increasingly fiendishly designed uh, self-constricting devices. You know, things that, that literally lock them into place in front of, in a road, in front of logging machinery. Uh, you know, they'll stick their arms in something and get padlocked so that they can't pull their arms out. Oh. They're literally making themselves uh, human blockades. They're putting wow. their bodies on the line. They're climbing these uh, bipods and tripods, which are 30, 40, 50 feet high in the air, chaining themselves to the top of the tripods. And then uh, what happens is the Royal Canadian Mounted Police come in. And they have to spend hours trying to extricate these people from these things. And while they're doing that, the logging trucks can't go by. And, uh, you know, the logging is delayed. So this is happening more and more, and it's escalating more and more. Uh, because what's part of what's going on is the RCMP are using, they're getting frustrated mm -hmm. because this is working. You know, yeah. these blockades are actually stopping the logging trucks. You have civil rights until your protest becomes effective. <laughs> well, and so the police are now bringing in heavy machinery like backhoes and using them within inches of the, the protesters. And so they're literally risking killing these protesters mm -hmm. in order to get them out of the way of the logging trucks. And uh, it, it's looking bad. It's, it's looking like it's going to keep escalating until something happens. Oh, man. Because it, it doesn't look like the premier of British Columbia is going to back down on this. He wants, he wants lots and lots of logging. So, uh, but once again, more than uh, now, the latest poll is more than 90% of people living in British Columbia want the old growth logging stopped. So it was it was in the 70s, and then it was in the 80s, now it's in the 90s. So the longer this goes on, the more people realize, you know, we should not be cutting down these last few old growth trees, you know, 2,000 years old, some of them. May the old gods be with you, babies. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's uh, continuing to heat up, continuing to go. Um, similar situation in, uh, in Minnesota for the Line 3 protest, uh, more and more arrests. Uh, each of them has crossed the 300 arrest mark. So there's, you know, almost, you know, there's over 600 people have been arrested in the last few weeks protecting either old growth or protecting the waters of, of Minnesota. So uh, we'll keep you, go keep you updated on those things. Uh, now we rush off to Turkey which is uh, governed by a pertinier dictator, a fellow named Erdogan, who's been in power for many, many years and has, you know, during his time in power, done the things that, you know, dictators do where, you, you know, you persecute the opposition and you, you know, make sure that you, you stay in power. And one thing Erdogan has done uh, the past decade or so, past few years, actually, past Four years, he announced a decade of massive, massive spending, massive infrastructure projects. Okay. So building big roads, building a huge, he's built one of the largest airports in the world. Um, and, you know, just spending money left and right. Turkey doesn't have that much revenue as a nation. So this is all being borrowed from the, you know, the multinational banks at really high interest rates. Uh, but one of the things he has announced, and they actually broke ground for this past week, is a canal. They they want to take a canal, uh, and they want to go uh, through the right through the middle of Turkey into the Black Sea. 
there's a couple of reasons this is a bad idea. One is that the the old shipping route that they that still exists and that you know they're currently using shipping has actually dropped by a, about a third in the last two years because most of that shipping was uh, oil and natural gas, mm. and demand is actually starting to fall around the world for oil and natural gas. So, so the need for it is looks like it's not actually there, but as the Green Party in Turkey, which is one of the only opposition parties left in Turkey, um, has pointed out that what they want to do by cutting across Turkey, they're going to tr- change hundreds of lakes and rivers from fresh water to salt water. Oh, boy. Because they're gonna, they're connecting one sea to another sea. And, and no one else who has a lot of bad ideas, dictators. Yeah, yeah. Once Once people get that unchallenged power, then they, they tend to make these really bad decisions. So uh, they broke ground on it, though, and it looks like they're, you know, who's going to stop him? He's, he's like nearly a dictator. And we are coming up to a period of time. Well, actually, we're, we're sometimes we've already been there this past year, especially uh, 2020. We were there when water is actually fresh water, drinkable water, potable water is a more valuable resource than oil. Oh, my God. Yeah, because, you know. Let's just chuck a whole bunch of it away. Yeah, and whenever you have a fresh uh, salt water going through a freshwater area, there's what they call saltwater intrusion. So to some degree, the surrounding groundwater also gets turned into salt water. Oh, boy. So, so once you cut a, a saltwater canal through your country, you are going to significantly reduce the amount of fresh water available in your country. And water is everything, folks. I mean, water, without water, you do not have an economy. And so this is a horrible decision by Erdogan. Did I ever tell you what happened to me during the Toledo crisis, water crisis? Oh, yeah. What happened? No. Yeah. I did not have a smartphone at the time and the library was closed. I heard, I believe that that evening... I heard about, uh, no, I think it was morning. Yeah, I woke up. I heard on the news that there was a water crisis and the water might kill you and (laughs) shut down your liver and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I had nothing. (laughs) You had had no water. Mm -hmm. I had to go down the hall, use my neighbor's phone to call my dad, who's in his 70s, and he had to get water for, like, he had to go out to Oregon initially and get water for, like, six people. Oh, yeah. And, no, you know, it's I'm on disability. It was, it was like, the end of the month. I didn't have any money. I couldn't even go get bottled water, even if there had been some. Couldn't get tea or other drinks. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, I think dad came over a couple times or no, he came over once. He gave me some water and but, you know, I couldn't rely on him too much. You know, he's old. I couldn't make him do that. And I had no I didn't even bus fare. There was the bus cost money at that point. Mm -hmm. So but I heard there were two points. uh, There was the high school on Cherry Street and then there was one on the east side. Uh, On the east side, they were giving away water and they and they were about equidistant so i uh nine o'clock that night i, I drank my last glass of water <laughs> and then i uh i got a wheelie suitcase i got a wheelie suitcase and set out walking for about the 45 minute to an hour walk to the east side to get water wow. and uh, this is like the third day and then like I, on the way out i met somebody who told me oh the water crisis is over <laughs> <laughs> well but still we here in toledo got a taste of you know just how important water is you know it makes me so angry when people say oh no it was a water panic it wasn't a water crisis oh. well you would flip and well panic too yeah and, if and you did not have a car or a phone for that i lived in bowling green at the time and you know all the stores down there were completely sold out so yeah it, people were going like ann arbor didn't even have water well let's hope that turkey doesn't uh, run out of, of water now that they're doing this horrible yeah, it's not a good feeling project. to not have no. any water all right well that's it for this hour gosh it's it, it, it flew by this week. It did. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody for listening. And uh, we'll be back next week. And I just, uh, you know, want to say, you know, water is important. Gardening is important. You know, it's all tied together. And electricity is important. It's all big, one part of one big system that we're all part of. So let's make it as green as possible so we can get to the green future for our descendants. All right. Well, that's it for this week. This is Joe Damar and Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off.
is fun. No more three-headed frogs, more kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting. 